The Juno World Affairs Council, in cooperation with 360 North, presents Spreading the Venezuelan Music Program El Sistema Worldwide with Tony Woodcock. Woodcock is the head of Boston's New England Conservatory, which recently wrapped a fellowship program that trained 50 musicians, including Juno music teacher Lori Hagee in El Sistema. The program has Venezuelan roots and aims to effect social change through youth music education. Good evening. It is great to be here in Juneau, Alaska. This is my first ever trip to Alaska and certainly my first ever trip to Juneau. And uh, I'm very impressed. My wife, Virginia, is as well. We have met so many wonderful people in the two days we have been here. And we have received such a welcome from all of you. But more than that, we have experienced in the last uh, 48 hours something truly extraordinary. And this extraordinary thing is happening at Glacier Valley Elementary School. And I have been experiencing the magic of the power of music that is happening in that school. And I'm going to be talking about that in just a little bit. But before I do that, I think I want to tell you a story as to why I'm here, why I got up at the crack of dawn a couple of days ago, traveled more than 3,000 miles to come to Juneau, Alaska. Because it's a very unlikely story in a way, and yet it now has a very, very strong logic and power to it. So I'll begin with a little introduction, if I may, to bring you into the story. First of all, let me just tell you a, a little bit about New England Conservatory, which is the oldest conservatory in the whole of the United States. It's a very magical place where music is in the air every single moment of every single day, and where new ideas can happen, and they can flourish. And one of the newest ideas we had at, I'll call it NEC for short, one of the newest ideas we had at NEC was a special training program called the Sistema Fellows. And last week, we completed a promise that we made to a man I'll be talking about in a little bit more detail, Jose Antonio Breu, to train 50 fellows over the course of five years. So we train 10 every year. And in the first year of training our fellows program, a young woman came to us expressing enormous interest in being part of this program. Her name was Laurie Hegie, and we were thrilled to accept her onto this program. And she became a leading light, not just in the first year of the program, but a leading light in the Sistema movement across America. And whenever people call me, as they do from time to time, to say, well, can we speak to somebody who you consider to be the exemplar of the best that is happening in this country? Can you give us an example of where this is really flourishing and taking root? I always start with Laurie. And I think that's one of the reasons I might be here today. So that's my little introduction. And I'll come back on some of this in order to tell my story. But let me tell you a little bit more about El Sistema. What is it? What does it mean? Where did it start? How long has it been going for? Well, El Sistema, when you translate it, it you come up with a rather mundane uh, title, which is The System. So I much prefer El Sistema because it sounds quite romantic in a way, and far more, far more interesting. So El Sistema has been in existence now for more than 35 years. And it was the brainchild of an extraordinary man, Jose, uh, Jose Antonio Abreu. And he conceived of the idea of uh, putting music in the center of society. But he didn't start with thousands of people lining up in order to be part of this program. He started as small as small could be. He started in his garage. And about a dozen people turned out one evening at his very special invitation to be part of a pioneering new program. And it started to take flight. 
So that, those uh, 12 people on the first night became 18 people, became 30 people, became 50, became 100, became 500, became 2,000. And today, there are more than 300,000 young people in this program in the whole of Venezuela. It affects every single city, every single town, whether it's in the mountains, whether it's, it's on the coastal regions, whether it's in the big cities like uh, Caracas. It is everywhere, making an astonishing contribution to the quality of life and teaching and learning and education. And the most important thing to know about its, uh, its major objective is that it's about giving music to the underserved, to the poverty-stricken, to those young people whose families can't afford to live in, in nice townhouses, they live in the barrios, the, the terrible areas that sur surround the big cities. And they have given them a lifeline, if you like, in a program which is really a social change program that allows them to touch the power of music. And the power of music to them has been transformational. So that these kids who come from the, these uh, poverty-stricken backgrounds have managed to make a difference, not only to their own lives, but because of the quality of their music making and the education that has been given to them, they make a change to their brothers and to their sisters, who also feel that they want to be part of this. They make a difference to their parents, who become very proud of their children, who also decide that they want to be leading their lives differently. And in so doing that, from the, the small entity of a family, society starts to be changed for the better as well. Abreu, Dr. Abreu, who began this program, I consider to be some type of genius. Because in the more than 35 years that this program has been happening, he's worked in the political arena with more than seven Venezuelan presidents, including Chavez, which cannot have been easy. And yet this man has drawn a path that has allowed him to be successful and has allowed him to bring government money into a centralized educational system that is making such a huge change. He's done this, I think, in, in a very simple but um, in defining it as simple, the whole process must have been incredibly complicated by not defining it as an education program, by not defining it as an arts program, but defining it as a social change program. And I think the social element that he has come up with, that is where all the governments that he has dealt with have said, yes, this resonates with us. So it's been an, a, 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 just the most incredible success story based upon that simple dilution into a compelling case that uh, the governments have understood there. NEC has had a long relationship with, with uh, Venezuela and with the Sistema program. We were the first conservatory in the United States to recognize Sistema and to create relationships with them. And back in 2008, I took uh, a group of people, so the group was about 20 strong, of funders and politicians and board members down to Venezuela. And we were given the opportunity, the experience, of being there in the community with Sistema, seeing what all this was about. At that stage, the only thing that I knew about was um, a 60-minute program, which was fascinating. It's a wonderful documentary, but that's all I knew. I was intrigued rather than sold on the idea. After a week down there, I wasn't just sold on the idea. I was its greatest apostle when I came back to, uh, to the United States. In fact, we all were, all 20 of us, when we came back, we'd had the most extraordinary experience. And I'll just try and characterize that for you. We were taken to uh, what are called nucleos. Uh, a nucleo is where all the teaching happens. And the teaching is very intense, 
and it's always after school. The Nucleos could have as many as two or three thousand young people in the program. And the idea is that you have your individual lesson, but you then have the opportunity to play in ensembles. It might be a small ensemble, as we saw so beautifully done just a second ago, to a larger ensemble in the form of a, of a big symphony orchestra, through to um, choirs so that singing is, uh, is very, very important. And as you start as a youngster, as you start to learn, as you start to improve, let's say you're four or five years old, by the time you're nine or ten, you'll be asked to do some teaching of the four and five-year-olds because that's important as well. You're giving back as well as continuing to learn yourself. So you get a virtuous circle of support within the program itself. There's one particular nucleo, and uh, my wife Virginia, I'm sure will remember this one. It was outside of Caracas, and we had to travel for a few hours to get there in, in terrible traffic. And uh, we arrived, it was very hot, the facilities were not great, there was no air conditioning, so we were a little bit uncomfortable. And the first thing we walked into was a room much smaller than this with a low ceiling, and there was an orchestra, violins, cellos, basses, violas, and next to it was another orchestra. What did I do with that? holding what they described as a paper orchestra. So this is an example of a paper violin. And the idea for this one, this is something that Laurie, I think, you made. The idea was that you give these paper violins, paper cellos, paper basses, to young people so that they can take care of them, so that they can respect them, so that when they eventually are given instruments, they know exactly what to do with them. So there they were, these youngsters, holding on to these paper violins, as if they were Stradivarius violins. This was something incredible to them. Not only that, but I, I watched and I observed how much work had gone into creating these paper violins. And the whole families, apparently, had become part of this. They painted them and they crafted them. They looked as if they could play extremely well. They were so beautifully done. So that whole mindset of how you treat an instrument began at that point. And then next to them, as I mentioned, was a real orchestra. Very, very young people. And they started to play for us. Stunning to hear their enthusiasm, to hear their commitment. Then we were taken into another room where there were four and five-year-olds playing percussion instruments. Not complicated percussion instruments, but getting rhythm going so that rhythm would become part of the way they thought about music. Then we walked into another room where people were singing. And singing is so important. We must never lose singing in our lives. I hope that you sing in your churches all the time because it's, it's where everything starts and the way that we communicate musically. Then we were taken into yet another room and there was a brass group playing as if their lives depended upon it. We were taken into a further room and there was this little combo which I would have paid money to hear. And this little combo comprised a double bass, a quattro, which is a four-string little guitar, which, which is tuned very strangely, a violin, and somebody with maracas and some percussion instruments. And they were going to play traditional Venezuelan music. And boy, did they play it. And everyone was getting into it, very, very excited. And then guess what happened when they finished the first piece? they switched instruments so that the violinist started playing the double bass and the double bass started playing the quattro and the quattro started playing the percussion instruments. And then they did a third piece and they switched again. And the fourth piece and they switched around. This was very impressive and very entertaining and full of the most wonderful energy. 
Finally, we were taken into their largest room, which was packed with an orchestra of about 80, possibly 90 young players. Now this was not a famous uh, nucleo. This was a nucleo that had apparently under, undergone some uh, considerable change and had had some issues. So there was the room packed with these young players dying to play for us. And I was so close to them, I was in within about six feet, the room was so small, that I went over and I looked to see what they were going to play. And the piece that they were going to play, I thought it must be an arrangement because this piece is incredibly difficult, it was Richard Strauss's Don Juan. Now the Chicago Symphony Orchestra practiced Don Juan and they find it difficult. So here, here are these very, very young people about to tackle one of the most difficult things ever written. So I thought, well, they're going to perhaps tentatively make their way through this piece. The conductor stood up, he put down the beat, the orchestra erupted. This was better than the Chicago Symphony. <laughs> Much better, because everything they were doing came from their hearts, so deeply from their hearts. And when they had finished, I think the best performance of this, this orchestral piece I think I've ever heard, when they finished that, I had to stand up and say congratulations and thank you to them. And my word, I meant every single syllable that I came up with at that moment. So the question then was, okay, we came back, we were transformed, we had had this astonishing experience. What do we do with this knowledge? What do we do with this trans transformation at NEC? So we cast around and we thought the best contribution that we could make to this burgeoning field of interest at this point was really to train people, train young people with a particular mindset who think about social change, who think about the world differently, think about the place of education, think about all the opportunities, but think about the challenges and the problems that we have globally to think about all of that and to identify some outstanding young musicians who would come to NEC and be part of a special program. And we discussed that with Dr. Abreu and he thought about it and he made some, some changes and he contributed some really wonderful ideas. But he came back and he said, I would love you to do this. And at that moment, the TED organization on the West Coast gave him a major award. And the award has a lovely name. It's called A Wish to Change the World. And I rather like that because we should all change the world. So here he was with, with a special award and a cash prize for that award as well. And he stood up in LA and he made an impassioned speech. And this is what he said. Here is my TED Prize wish. I wish you would help create and document a special training program for at least 50 gifted young musicians, passionate for their art and for social justice, and dedicated to developing El Sistema in the US and other countries. And that's how it all began back there in 2008, 2009. There was a minor uh, challenge, which was raising money to make all of this work. But we were successful in raising money, and we continue to be successful raising money for this program. The cost of it in its first year was $550,000, and we raised that in fairly short order. And uh, my board was very, very supportive of this, of this development, because they could feel the charge in it. They could feel the electricity and the energy coming from uh, the potential. Laurie, as, as I have mentioned, became part of that first program, which I think we sort of stitched together as best we could. But we gave them, I think, in that, even in that first year, a, a wonderful opportunity. And the central part of that oppor opportunity was to send them down to Venezuela to become part of El Sistema. 
And the idea wasn't that they would go down to Caracas and sit in a nice hotel and have seminars and people coming and saying, this is what it's like and uh, here are some pictures and a few videos. That didn't happen at all. They went out to some of the most obscure places across Venezuela you could think of and they were dropped right in the center of Sistema and they were told, get on with it. We want you to teach. We're not going to tell you how to do it, you'll just become part of our philosophy, part of this intensive nature of teaching El Sistema. There's one story that I've always loved very much, and uh, we had a young conductor as part of the first year called Jonathan Govius, and he went to a, a, a small town, and he was ushered into a very, very hot, he said the temperature was about 120 degrees in this room, full of these kids, and he said, well, what do you want me to do? And uh, the organizer went up to him, gave him the baton, gave him some scores, and he said, we have a concert in 10 days' time. Prepare these people for it. <laughs> he said he had the greatest time of his life because these kids really wanted to perform. They really wanted to get better. And the curious thing was, even though some of their performing standards were limited, whatever happened within that incredible mix of being in an ensemble, being in an orchestra, their standards suddenly went somewhere else. They went through the roof. It became something improbable because they could do magical stuff as a result of feeling the energy around them as well. That was the central part of the program and has remained a central part of the program every single year. We also send them out to do internships around America. Once upon a time, we used to send them out to established orchestras. I think we sent Laurie Heggie out to Glasgow, if I'm not mistaken. These days, because of the success of our fellowship program, we send them to the past fellows. Laurie has been very generous in receiving a number of our fellows over the last few years. And she's, I know you've thrown them into your classroom and you've said, get on with it. And rightly so, rightly so. So we're very focused in this program about teaching, teaching within this philosophy. But we also want to give them the experience and the training of all the other stuff that happens around music and teaching, which is the entrepreneurial stuff. How do you raise money? How do you go about marketing? How do you get programs on television? How do you do PR? So it's, it's a two-channel uh, program which over the course of 12 months prepares these extraordinary young musicians for the challenge of going out there and becoming part of an astonishing movement. I'm going to tell you a little bit about I'm just going to set up a, a video I'm going to show you in just, uh, just one second. This is a fellow from the third year. And his name is David France. He lives and works in Boston. He stayed in our community. And he accepted a challenge to create an El Sistema-inspired nucleo in Roxbury and Dorchester. Those are really difficult areas socially deprived children. And he went in there, and in the last couple of years, he's really made a difference. So I'd like to play for you just a very brief video which shows the type of experience he is creating for his new community. Quiere trabajar con quién? Con niños que tienen hambre, hambre de música, hambre de, de cultura, de saber este, la música, de aprender el violín. Yo quiero robarle a la calle a los niños. La calle se los quito. Son niños que van al mundo con su arte. Son niños que van a abrirse el, el, este, el, la cabeza, el cerebro, van a abrirse eh, sus conocimientos, van a 
es que tienen mucha hambre de saber, del saber. Y la música les va a dar, les va a abrir los ojos a otro mundo. Y estoy muy feliz por esos niños. Estos niños que son los que menos poder de adquisición tienen, porque son niños muy pobres. Son niños que comen una vez nada más. Niños que, pero ellos son los que aprenden más. I think that's, that really tells the story. And then I want to set up this second video, because this is, uh, it, it doesn't have those production values, it doesn't have the production values of, of uh, this wonderful television uh, station. It's, it's somebody with their iPhone, and it's one of our fellows from the second year, and he's somewhere in, in the heart of, uh, of Venezuela. And he's taking uh, a video of something called the White Hands Choir. Now, just to explain what that is, the White Hands Choir, you'll see these, uh, these children, these very special children, with white gloves on. The, as I say, the production values aren't great, the sound isn't great, but you'll start to experience something. The kids who are wearing white gloves all have very special needs. They are severely handicapped. They can't perform, they can't sing. So instead of excluding them, what Sistema has done is to pull them in with something that's very special. So that when the choir is singing next to them, they act all the words that are being sung to them. So that you experience a performance at two levels. You experience the beauty of the singing, and then you experience the very moving beauty of the White Hands Choir experiencing the sounds and the words of the poetry that they're hearing as well. Let's see that. I hope at least some of the power of that comes over to you in, in, that, in that video. So five years on, we have completed Dr. Abreu's wish. We have trained 50 extraordinary young musicians. What did NEC achieve at the end of all of that? Well, our fellows are out there. They really are leading the movement for our Sistema in North America. They're in 25 U.S. cities. The, one of the most interesting things for me is that some of the fellows in the first year and the second year have started to employ fellows from the third year and the fourth year. So you've got this wonderful virtuous circle happening there as well. Five years ago, there were maybe 50 or 60 kids in what would be described as a, an El Sistema-inspired program. 
Today, there are literally thousands of kids in these programs. And there are nucleos, there are El Sistema inspired initiatives across the nation whose budgets range from $40,000 a year now to $1.3 million a year. And every time I check in to see how many uh, nucleos there are, each day I do that, it's increased. So now I believe there's well over 100 happening nationally. And I think that that should gladden all our hearts that this is being taken so, so seriously. Here's a little flavor of an El Sistema inspired uh, program in Boston. It's at the Charter Lab School, which NEC helped to found. And one of the uh, one of the points I would make about calling things El Sistema inspired is that you can't take from Venezuela everything that Venezuela does. You have to adapt it. And you have to adapt it to the needs of a community. We don't have a centralized system in this country. So every Sistema inspired initiative is different because it's saying, what do you need? How can we help? How can we get funded? How can we put a structure together that will ensure our success? So this is a very different structure um, to, the, uh, to the structure that you would find in, uh, in Venezuela. But as you'll see from this video with David Malek, who was a contemporary of Laurie's from year one, you'll see what he has been able to contribute to the movement. Music is music, with whether we're in elementary school or these professionals that we work with every day. We're all on the same path, and, and we're just at different points in that journey. Dr. Abreu uses the orchestra as the perfect um, this metaphor for a perfect society or community, one that comes together for agreement. I don't think they have a perspective of how far they have come and how beautiful they sound now. And we had a, a concert the other week at the State House. And a friend of mine was in town, a, a wonderful musician. And we looked over, and within the first three notes of them playing, he had tears rolling down his face. So, Juno, Alaska, and the Glacier Valley Elementary School. Glacier Valley Elementary School, Kennedy Center, recognized as a school of distinction. That is something really to be proud of for the whole community. And I think what is happening at this wonderful ele elementary school is something the entire nation could learn from. And so I'll tell you what my wife and I have experienced in these last couple of days. We've experienced these wonderful young musicians, so you've seen some of the program. We've witnessed wonderful discipline. I've never been into a classroom where it's been so quiet, but it's been quiet not because the students are terrorized by the teachers, but because they're interested because there is a culture of respect. Respect to the teachers and respect to their fellow students as well. You saw them when they performed just a moment ago. How keen they were to know that they were on stage. How, what the protocol is. How they are with you as an audience. These are all 
wonderful attributes to have as a young musician. The creativity coming out of the school is absolutely palpable. The kids are so articulate and they're polite and they're courteous and they're assertive. I was corrected yesterday by two five-year-olds. <laughs> On the first occasion, I referred to a violin as a machine. And without, you didn't even do this, it's not a machine, it's an instrument. <laughs> and he was right, and I was wrong. <laughs> and Laurie asked whether I would help uh, a, a young lady who was uh, uh, having s just uh, holding the instrument and where she was putting her fingers. So I, I went to do this, and we were getting on very well, and then she put her, her violin down, and I said, now put your violin back up, because I'm, and she said, I'm in rest position now. <laughs> no way was she going to not be in rest position. <laughs> the kids listen. They want to perform. When Laurie was saying to them, what, uh, what would you like to do? A, a forest of hands would go up because they're really keen to show the joy they have in their music making. They're team members. It's a wonderful team spirit that has happened. And I'm going to use a very old-fashioned word, but it's one I really firmly believe in. These kids have been empowered. Empowered in a really unbelievable sense so that they all are leaders they're not looking to be leaders and they're not looking to one leader and I think that that is really really special I experienced a garage band this morning which is new for me shows what a what a secluded life I have led <laughs> and the garage band it was in the technology uh, room. Uh, so a wonderful teacher explained what was happening by showing this app and my wife and I were looking at this thing, you know, how did they do that? Uh, but hopefully we, we kept our dignity I hope. And the kids looked at all of this and within about 10 minutes they had created their own pieces of music based upon this app and they were good pieces of music and they were eclectic and there was jazz in there and there was rhythm and percussion and all the rest of it. Very, very impressive. I experienced dance and percussion. I experienced a wonderful tribute to the Klingit tribe uh, which was full of, of percussion and full of dance and full of song. And this morning we also experienced the wonderful interface between music and math. How you can get kids, uh, these were first years, how you can get kids out there learning about counting and relating it to music and beating um, a, a percussion instrument. I thought that that was really extraordinary. Just think what has been achieved by this astonishing leader you have in your midst, Laurie Heggie. Just a few years ago, four or five years ago, there may be 40, 50 kids in the program. Today, there are 400. Next year, there will be 500. That's astonishing. The existence of anything like this can have huge ripple effects throughout a community. It can go into the high school, it can go into the university as well. Something is bubbling up here through the strata of your society that you need to capture. It's always fragile. Always there are these big debates about priorities. Where's the money going to come from? How can we cut this? How can we cut that? You cannot cut your way to excellence. It's not possible. You need resources. And through the vagaries of what happens politically, you know, if I need to fly over during the legislature next year and bang some heads together with your politicians, I'm very happy to do that <laughs> because this is important. 
the most important investment any society can make on God's earth is to invest in the education of its young. Let us never forget that. That is our creed occur. That should be the last thing we ever think of stopping or cutting or affecting in any way. Laurie's program has benefited from the uh, 21st century grant and it's benefited from that because of its success and because of its mission which is to look at helping people who are deprived, people in poverty. And I think that that is incredible. And how can we not do that for our future? So I've said a lot over the last 45 minutes. I'm going to ask Laurie if she'd be very kind enough to join me here at the podium because I'm going to invite some questions from all of you. And then after we've taken a few questions, I'm going to uh, ask our third graders to come back and perform for you again. Thank you. Oh, sorry. The most important thing, I've just been reminded, is there's a wonderful video about jam, which we're going to look at now. <laughs> so try to find that. Jam, Juneau, Alaska Music Matters, is an El Sistema-inspired program that came from Venezuela. Ready, here we go. And it's music that helps us develop exceptional human beings. Music builds those critical habits that you need to be successful so that when our students deal with failure, they don't just quit. Our hope is that they know how to pick themselves back up and continue to persevere because they know in music, it's very hard to master all of these things, but then they see the product of what happens when they continue with it. That product, learning to focus and self-discipline in their core classrooms, says kindergarten teacher Kay Peters. Her kids, she says, benefiting from 90 minutes each week in Lori Hagee's music room for jam. When we started jam, um, it's just been amazing as far as the focus and the um, on-task behavior that we have in our classrooms. The kids are so much more confident in themselves. And myself as a teacher, I'm more confident. I have learned so much. I can play the violin. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me to show that. <laughs> so, some questions. Please, there's a microphone there if you want to st come up to the stand. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, what, now that you've had five years under your belt of, and 50 of you fellows, what is the next step for the um, New England Conservatory? Well, for NEC, what we're going to do is rather than just stop it and say, well, mission accomplished, what we're doing for the next few years is a professional development program for those 50 that have already been through this program. So we're going to, having invested in these wonderful young people, we're going to reinvest in them and ask, well, how can we help a bit more here and what would you like from us? We're going to do that for a few years and then we're going to see what shall we do after that. So we're very much there, very much there. Other questions? Go on. <laughs> yep. Now this looks official. You've written your question down. <laughs> I have written my question down. Well, wow. in, in Juno, you know that our kindergarten and first grade and first graders receive 90 minutes of violin instruction a week, a week as an in-school model. Mm -hmm. It's an in-school model. And it sounds like um, most nucleo are solely after, after school programming. Um, 
I, well, yep, maybe this is for Lori. I'm wondering if you're aware of other in-school models because I'm, I'm actually the teacher at Riverbend Elementary and for us the in-school model works very well. Hitting, it hits all the students Wonderful. and it's really connected us as our school as a community and um, made our culture much stronger. But I, I'm wondering if there are other in-school models, what they look like and if that's something that in the future other schools are looking at or other districts are looking at what we're doing here be based on that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca Ricker, who has started uh, a JAM program at Riverbend Elementary School, the other Title I school in Juneau, and they have successfully uh, are finished kindergarten and first, so you have about 100 students who are using violin, just as Glacier Valley is, as an intervention for school readiness skills. Um, when I was in the fellowship five years ago, there was one school, to my knowledge, that had an in-school model, and it was in Baltimore, the ORCIDS program, and they're partnered with the Baltimore Symphony. And I um, then went to Scotland, because that was the only other place that I knew of that was doing an in-school model. And it made sense to me, because if it's about access for all of our kids, even after school, can sometimes become a barrier for our families. And because of what music does for the brain in tuning, helping them to, pr to access language, for focus, discipline, why not make sure that all of our kids at that early age have those skills developed through music for school readiness? So we have actually been taking the lead in the country. We've had uh, Denver, Colorado, who has started a program and has seen JAM um, as an inspiration for their startup. Portland's Bravo program has also started up um, an in-school model. And we're noticing that our kids are successful at playing because they have the help of a kindergarten teacher who knows the kids really well, the music teacher, so that when they move into an after-school program, they're already playing. It's really hard to have a little kindergartner learning how to play an instrument at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the day. But when you have them during the day working with their teachers, then in second grade, they're playing music and they're building those relationships with the other students in a really quality, um, supportive program. And we have a lot of staff members at our school that have made that possible because right now we have 110 children about 66% of every grade level from second, third, and fourth who choose to be a part of our after school program for um, two hours a week, sometimes twice a week, definitely t twice a week, but sometimes even three times a week. So, yeah, so we are, we're making a ripple effect around the country at how this in school model really helps set the stage for a successful after school program. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Other questions? Great question. Yes, we are thinking of going whale watching tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> See that balloon above you? Yes? I've been reading some science lately about the effect of early childhood education in music on young brains. And I wondered if you're going to do any long range studies, say of the children in Venezuela. I don't know, but I think that would be, you have this great captive group, it yeah, would be a great yeah. thing to do. Well, yeah, I think that's a really wonderful question. I'll, have a, I'll attempt to answer it, but I think you'll, you'll perhaps do much better than I. We've been very fortunate in the last couple of years in having uh, uh, one or two fellows who have come to us with uh, very much a research mentality. I'm thinking of Elaine in particular. And I, I think you're right. I think there needs to be some, some good studies done because if, if you can <coughs> prove these things at the political level and at the funding level, I think these things count for a great deal. So I think you make a really valid point. Yeah, I, I know that in uh, California for the LA Phil, they've been looking at their OLA program, uh, YOLA, to do some research. And 
we have, we'll have 500 kids next year. I, there's been some research about that it's these non-cognitive factors that make the difference for children to be successful in school. And they've identified four of them. A sense of belonging, purpose, um, effort, and success. And when I think about what this JAM program does, we are developing those four aspects, um, which then lead to academic perseverance, which then leads to these academic behaviors that help them in school. So it'd be wonderful to be able to find a way to do some research here because we have a large student body that are involved in JAM between um, Glacier Valley, Riverbend, and Oak Bay. Yeah. Very good question. So. Yes, please. Are you planning on trying to go on, into all the elementary schools here in Juneau? Do you want to repeat the question? The question was, are we planning to have JAM programs in all of the elementary schools? We, have, um, we would love that, and it's been really up to the school to come and ask if they would like to have it, and then we um, do whatever we can to, to make it happen. Megan Johnson, who's the principal cellist for the Juno Symphony, has taken on the charge of coming to Glacier Valley on Monday, learning what we're doing, and then going to the other schools to pass it on. So it really is this ripple effect of passing it down the lane so that we keep that quality and consistency and, and then give the opportunity for the kids to play together. Uh, last week, the Juno, we had the um, community day out at UAS with Juno Jazz and Classics, and we had um, Glacier, or Oak Bay and Riverbend came together and played for that. And since they already knew the pieces, it's very much like what you see in Venezuela, is that they know it and they, they don't even need to rehearse. They just come up together and are playing. So time for one last question, then we're going to go back to the third graders. So stand by. It's your one minute warning. <laughs> the last question? Yes, sir. It's just a wonderful program. I just can't. Thank you enough, Lori, for bringing it to Juno. And I'm wondering uh, what we can do in this room and as a community to help you in your efforts. Is there anything in particular that comes to mind that would be helpful for you? Thank you, Bruce. Yes, I first of all, I uh, want to thank this community because I, what makes this JAM program so strong is that it really is a hybrid. It's uh, the parents, about 50% of our parents buy violins. The uh, community has helped pay for instruments and training, and then the school district has protected the music teacher's position for at least four and a half hours so that they can work alongside the teachers in K-1 to do this violin program. The, the hard part is finding um, violinists and other uh, stringed musicians who can come into our schools. The 2.30 to 4.30 time is really hard. The Juno Symphony has been helping us with their um, student symphony to give us a chance to play with them. But as we grow, the demand is huge. It's amazing how many kids want to play after school together. And we're just having a very hard time finding musicians who can come at that time to work with our kids. Um, so if you know of anyone out there, volunteer or otherwise, that would like to come out, we definitely have some kids eager. Uh, the other piece is fundraising. Um, I'm a full-time teacher who also works after school in the club. And so anybody who wants to help with um, fundraising or has some grant writing, we're getting to that point where we're large enough that we're ready for those, those bigger grants to, to make an impact so that we can expand. The goal is to expand every grade level. So Glacier Valley is the oldest of the programs. And so we, our oldest kids are third graders who are here today. Next year, we hope to expand to fourth and at Riverbend and Oak Bay to second, which spills into the after school model. So there's a lot of eager young musicians who would love to work with members of the community. Very good. Laurie, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Shall we welcome the third graders back? <laughs>
That was Tony Woodcock speaking about the spread of El Sistema in this Juno World Affairs Council presentation. It was produced in collaboration with 360 North and recorded May 21, 2014 at 360 in Juno.